Good day, everyone. Welcome to today's um, AfriMap R meetup. Um, so the Af purpose of AfriMap R meetup is to support the development and active learning of Africa R mapping um, of the Africa R mapping community. So it's a platform where we basically share what we have learned, share our experiences, showcase our work, and learn about resources, ask questions, um, and just connect to other people who are learning R or experts in R. Um, and um, you can learn more about Africa AfriMap R on the AfriMap R um, website, and you can follow us on Twitter, um, where we post amazing R work. <coughs> Um, and today we have Alistair Otta who will be sharing his uh, work and what he has done in his journey. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Alistair who will introduce himself and get straight to his talk. So thank you very much for the opportunity and it's, it's nice to meet people with some familiar faces and some lesser known people. So this is not going to be hugely about R so much as just mapping in general. Um, maybe a little bit of background, which I think is useful, is to explain where kind of how we fit into the in here at all. Um, okay. Um, so Media Collective is a um, it's a for-profit organization based in South Africa. Um, we're technically a couple of years old, but I mean the name Media Collective has been around for a number of years. I think it goes back to early 2000s um, in some, some other form. Um, we're essentially a group of journalists <clears throat> and we call ourselves a collective because we, uh, as you know, the journalism industry is changing a lot. A lot of people are falling out of the industry because of retrenchments and closing down publications. And we started working with a number of different people, um, journal, former journalists, trying to kind of develop what we would broadly call data journalism. Um, in South Africa, but more broadly, recently across the continent. And really, we've been trying to grow the capacity both in, for ourselves and for generally by, through training and, and such like to grow the capacity to do visual journalism, data-based journalism on the continent. Um, right now, we mostly specialize, specialize in data journalism, visualization and training. Um, most of the training is is across the continent through various collaborations that we have. We have um, a partnership called Africa Data Hub, which works in three different countries across the continent, um, and we do training well beyond those three countries. Um, one of our main focus areas, as I say, we, we're journalists essentially. So really, we use in this context, we use maps to try and communicate the work that we do. Um, we try and explain things through the use of maps and other visualization techniques. Somebody uh, asked, said they went, I think I think it was another said wasn't familiar with the outlier. So this is my quick plug. Outlier is a publication. So interestingly, there's not a lot of scope for publishing data journalism slash visualization on this continent, and especially in South Africa and mainstream publications. It's often um, it's often very intense kind of work, so it's often very costly kind of work. Um, and increasingly, we although we do work by the people, we decided that we needed an outlet for the work that we wanted to do, and so we set up the outlier. The outlier is now a self-standing publication of its own, and we try and articulate kind of the what we consider the main social social issues in there, particularly in South Africa, but increasingly across the continent. The social and, and economic issues that affect people's lives through the use of data and visualization. So we try, we we have a feature, for example, where we do a chart of the day, where we try and kind of either tap into something that's currently newsworthy or something that often it's more really what issues that we think are important for people to understand. So things like education, health. I mean, our main areas of work are health, education. Um, politics to some some degree, economics to some degree, and more recently and more excitingly, sport journalism, which is um, not in the traditional sense, but in data journalism. So really we uh, we cover we cover these through the through the outlier public publication. We have a newsletter that we send out every two weeks, which is so if anyone wants to sign up, I'll put some information at the end about that. Um, so really we we kind of approach we kind of approach all the work that we do. Um, through the through the lens of of how do we explain things to people and i think that that's kind of the core thing that I, that i'm going to talk about 
our experience um, in doing mapping is really um, we we do mapping intentionally in a in a way that we want to explain things to people. So sometimes it's very opinionated and honestly I'm, I'm putting this warning here because I, I am I do have relatively strong opinions about maps and I think we may you know we this may be a slightly different approach to just simply mapping something um, rather have an intentional approach to it in the way that we show maps. So um, I'm just putting that there as a as a, as a, as a forewarning. Um, so when we when we look at maps I, I think and partly this goes to the problems that I see that when people make maps is, and, and I probably only really need one rule, um, and it's the biggest one is, when we approach something is, should we really be making a map? And far too often, I think that people make maps um, when, a, when other visualization or other techniques would suffice. Um, and in many cases, I think we, we often bump our heads against this, and I see a lot of people doing it, is that we've got a piece of data or a set of data which has got some geographic data in it, and therefore we think, well, a map's the obvious way to do it. And it often is the obvious way to do it, but very often it's not the most effective way by any means. Um, I think you need to be quite intentional about how you approach mapping. Um, I think, ironically, in the last sort of, over the past, I don't know, I'm saying 10 years, I think, Mapping technology has become increasingly accessible, and which is fantastic, but it's also it has a major downside, which is that it um, it allows anyone to make a map, and doesn't really necessarily, it, it, which is a very good thing in many ways, but it also does mean that everyone sees it's actually ironically easier to make a map nowadays um, than most other forms of, of visual journalism. So oftentimes people tend towards just kind of taking the data, putting it on a map and saying it's done. And I think it's a term that we kind of probably slightly crudely use, we dumping data onto a map. And I think the one thing that we try and do is not is avoid that by being a bit more intentional about it. Um, the second rule, and we'll go, I'll go through some of these, what I mean by this, but I mean, the second rule to me is like, what are you actually trying to show on a map? Um, as I say, there's a tendency often to, maps are really easy to make, but they, you know, if you put a, just put a lot of data onto a map, um, it's not necessarily in, like immediately obvious to the user what they what they see. Um, I think oftentimes people get there. There is a tendency to make particularly interactive maps that are very very detailed, but actually a lot of the messaging gets lost in the, in in that case um, because it's it's it largely transfers the the need for the reader to rather than the reader looking at and going i understand what this map means it's here's here's a whole lot of stuff find your own meaning in it which is a problem and i think it's something that we are very careful about is like are you actually articulating an opinion or an insight through your map or are you simply putting it in front of people and hoping that they find their own meaning and that's something that is a real pet thing thing of mine which is it's not just maps, it's about the visualization in general. Too often, I think we fall back onto putting the work of finding the insights onto the reader. And I think we try and avoid that as much as possible. And the, the which ties basically into the third rule, which to me is, how do you want users to use your map? I mean, are you, are you explicitly expecting them to explore it? Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but do you expect users to explore your map and find the insights? Um, which may be the case, which maybe have it, does in certain circumstances has a value, and in other cases not. Or, or do you are you trying to explain a particular point of view or a particular insight that you've had? Um, so, sorry, I'm dumping around. I will I'll touch on those in a moment. The the different types, but I think to me those sort of the, the general three areas when we approach any project. Um, this probably should have gone earlier, but over the last ten years we've seen. Almost every single person that we do a lot of freelance work, we do a lot of contract work for people. Almost every single person that approaches us starts off by asking for a map. Um, in many cases, we do end up doing, making a map, but in many cases, um, we we sometimes steer them away from a map. And I think it's 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 just a very common format, and I think people have an attachment to maps that you know. Um, they seem, they make you look very clever. And that's been leading cynical. I think that there's the technology out there to make a map is very easy, um, but they can be made very hard. They're not hard to make, but they're very hard to do well. Um, so we're just in terms of approaching maps, and I'm gonna go through a couple of like 
some of the some of the things that I think that we need to think about when we make our maps and how we make them a bit more useful to people. That what I'm saying, what, what I was saying earlier about when you're making a map, how do you expect a user to use it is, is one of the key things for us. We, to a large degree, have increasingly moved away from interactive type of visualizations because towards a static approach, because it it gives us a it it makes us it forces us into thinking a little bit harder about what is it that we're trying to convey with this map rather than relying on that interactivity to provide the value to people. Um, but there are instances in where an explanatory type an exploratory type of approach is much better. And maybe I should have had an example in here, but you know, a visual example, but um, when I say that there's two different ways of approaching a map, it's like, are you trying to illustrate something very explicit with a map, which is more explanatory, i.e. you don't expect the person to the reader to do a lot of work or the user to do a lot of work. They just, it's by the simple design of the map, it's apparent. Or are you ex expecting to, to explore the map? Um, and there is a case for exploratory style maps, I think. Um, one, for example, is if you did a, if you mapped, educate some, some aspect of education, for example, or schools in, across the country, across South Africa or across the continent, whatever the case may be, it would be, there would be value um, in illustrating the trends on, a, on an explanatory map. But the exploratory side is most people have children or have an attachment to a particular school or a particular geographic area. So being able to drill down to that, that particular area or, or, their, or the school that they're involved with makes a lot of sense. So it gives that dimension. But I think that simply putting map data on a map and expecting people to explore it and find values is, is naive. I think it, we, we need to be much more, we need to decide that it has a, has it, has a point. Um, also, I think when we, when we approach maps, we need to understand what, what the audience already knows. Like, are we, are, are we expecting them to like kind of click around endlessly on a map to understand what the value of the map is? Um, or do we assume that they know certain amounts of information? Um, and then I, this is just um, testing your map. I think one of the thing, the problems that we have is I think that that not a, not enough people kind of test their map data as early as possible. So when when we work with something, we often start with a map um, in a separate in a separate presentation. I have done we, we actually will often use like a map as an exploratory technique rather than a final visualization technique. So really it's a put everything onto a map, explore what it looks like, try and draw out insights from that, and then take that and distill it further in your final product. Um, but there's but I mean there's a lot of there's a lot of different ways to to approach these things. Um, one of the so I mean I think there's one of the challenges that we have when we try and when we when we're making maps um, is how do we how do we kind of work out a process to improving our maps and and how do we improve the way that they that they are perceived or received by users? Um, so there's a number of things that we do and and I'm, what I'll do now is I'll just run through some of the, the core core elements of the way that we present data on maps and how we think about it um, and then and then a little a little bit after that I'll I'll just run through some of the, the tools that we use to actually make make the maps that we do at this point. Um, so I think there's there's when we when we kind of looking at how we make maps, not all maps are equal. There's 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 various ways ways to approach maps, um, and I think we need to be very clear on whenever you're starting to make a map, is think about how you're actually going to present it. And I call it being purposeful, or maybe it should be mindful or something. Something that I, it's something that you need to approach within like some sort of intent. And I think there's five, five key elements that I think that are important to, to when we're making maps is to understand that just putting, um, putting data onto a map is not, is, not, is not sufficient. I think we need to understand like how, what are we trying to convey with that? So for example is, I mean, there's an endless array of different types of maps that we could have, but I think that there's five different ways that we, that there's a number of different ways that you can present it. And one is obviously through what most people call a maps, which most people have seen. Um, and these kinds of maps, obviously we're distributing, we're showing the distinction between different kinds of different areas on a map. Um, typically the colors would be darker for higher incidence and lower for lower incidence or something along those lines. Um, I think that those are, 
those those are, those are useful and they're probably the more common the, the more common ones the the pitfalls of of these kinds of these kinds of maps are potentially when you have a, an enormous array of 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 elements they can become very dense um, and hard to understand um sometimes there there is a there is a better way of approaching it which is to show like some sort of symbol map or proportional symbol map um I'm, I'm largely in favor of this because I think it adds another dimension, which I'll talk about in a moment as well. But I think that there's an opportunity that, to add a number, number of different dimensions on a map through that. And then obviously there's locator maps and heat maps. Locator maps is just where you're located in the world. Um, and then a heat map shows that, that distribution of, of, of something um, potentially over time or the distribution over, over a geographic area. I think there's, there's the, the thing to, that, we, that we kind of tend to focus on, our map, for example, that we do with the outliers on the left there, we did a lot of work around um, coronavirus um, over the last two and a half years. Um, so this is just one of probably dozens and dozens of maps that we've made. Um, I think that those, you know, we just, you, we need to think through each of the kind of formats that we use, not, we don't just simply put the, the data on a map and hope that it works. Um, I'm very much in favor of like edging towards a static style um, because it forces us to think a little bit clearer about how much information we can get onto a map and what, what makes it clear. Um, the big, I think to me, the biggest challenge with the biggest challenge with making maps and the thing that we kind of spend the most time on, and it's probably a design thing more than a mapping thing, but it's thinking about color. And I think there's a number of dimensions to thinking about color. The problem with a lot of we have a lot of that we have with a lot of map like coloring of maps is that humans are typically very hard find it very difficult to distinguish between these fine grained kind of gradients of color. So the, the, at the top there we've got a uh, dollar amounts. It's a random uh, random selection, but um, those are very very difficult to kind of distinguish between one and the other necessarily, particularly if that's applied on a map, um, which means that. You know that like there is a there's a value in having those sorts of legends, but you need to think about whether they whether somebody can distinguish between that this one, one area and another, um, and understand the difference between them. So there's different kind of approaches to maps that that we would apply, um, and the one the 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 kind of the primary primarily the three ways that we approach approach maps is through one of three kind of colored patterns, which is a categorical one, a sequential one, a diverging one. And I think that they're useful in, in, in different instances. So, I mean, we would approach a categorical one and some of these, are, some of these I think are from the, um, the economist by the style and one of, the, one of them is not. Um, the categorical style of map, the one on the far left is very good when you are dealing with instances of of pieces of information that are distinct from one another, one another. So they aren't on a continuum, or aren't they? Aren't necessarily directly related. So it's um, so one color would represent one grouping of people, for example, and another would represent somebody else. Um, these may be applied, for example, on a uh, an election map at the level of where you say this area was voted for this party, this area voted for this party. They wouldn't necessarily represent the how many votes that they got necessarily, but they would often, but they would have two distinct kind of represent areas represented or multiple areas. So they would be distinct colors for different different um, different parts of it. Then the sequential one, which shows, it, shows something over a period of along a continuum so obviously from from uh, from one color to another color um, to show an increasing increasing occurrence of something so we would use this um, for example in the in the in the map in the in the elections kind of example we would use this to show um, the, the level of support for a particular party um, by the the, the 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 shade of color that we use, and this often we'll use we'll use like one color, but like various shades of one color, or a continuum of one color to another. Um, I think those are good when you when you're dealing with something that is continuous, so something is ten percent, twenty percent, thirty percent, forty percent, whatever. 
Um, and then there's divergent colors, which are whenever there's an obvious like kind of middle point in your set of data, there's a lot or there's a, there's few, there's more of this or there's fewer of those. Um, and you really want to distribute, show that distribution over a period or, or over a geographic space. Um, the idea in this instance would be to have two different colors um, with a center point, which may be kind of like a white or whatever in this instance, but you would show like all the reds are much more of and the, the blues are much less of. It's just two, it's not a, it's a continuous scale in some senses, but it's also two different distinct colors to illustrate that change over, over a geographic area. I mean, there's there's lots of different ways, but I think the point about this is that we need to think about like, so what does this data represent and how do we show it on a map um, as best possible? Um, and then I think a lot of a lot of good map design for us comes down to comes down to how we um, how we use colors. Um, and I think that I mean there's a there's a thing in a, a lot of design kind of spaces. Often think tools are developed with kind of default settings, and often those default settings are not particularly useful. Um, and I, you shouldn't just kind of apply the the most obvious, just a lot, just go with the obvious flow. Um, this, so for example, we, we we play around with a lot of when we're making maps with different kinds of um, with different shades. And I think one of the things that we that we do, for example, on the left hand side here, yeah, and I find this particularly useful a lot of the time is when we get a map, like the tendency is to just kind of like have these borders marked and stuff like that. And if you think about it, in some instances, like having those, those borders marked on your map, for example, which may be the default or often is the default, may actually just detract from the, 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 the final value of your map. So I, I picked these two, for example, and I'm not exactly sure what the data was. I can't remember, but it was a, it's a really nice example of it is, there you have a picture of the United States with a distribution of, of the information across it. The, the top, sort of slightly off to the top left, keeps the borders in place. Whereas if you look particularly down the west coast um, of the US there, those red dots become increasingly hard to hard to see because they, they've been cluttered it together with the border with the border colors. If you just if you take those off or reduce their reduce their appearance. You can suddenly start to see a much clearer definition, and I think this goes to the point about like when we're making maps, what are we actually trying to show? Like, you know, are we are we trying to show geographic precision, or are we trying to show a generalized pattern, a pattern of of behavior, or a pattern of occurrence, or whatever the case? Um, and I think, you know, I mean, the one on the towards the bottom right is clearly also looks a little bit more arty, so maybe that that will, you know. But if it suffices, if it gets across the message more effectively. The one on the top left, for example, and we, we, we is probably particularly on that east, also on the east coast of, of that top map. You can see the borders actually crowd out the most of the information completely. Um, so it's just something to think about is that simple changes like that make such a such a big difference. We we see it a lot in the maps that we that we do. We do we do a lot of maps, we do a chart every day, and we, not all of them, but a lot of them are maps. Um, oftentimes just Small changes like changing the colors, making them a bit darker, a bit lighter, less washed out, adds a level of definition to the thing. If we really want to, if we're trying to enhance the, the, the geographic precision, make it a bit darker, otherwise de emphasize it to give that distribution feel, it just changes the overall effect of it. <coughs> so um, I'm not sure that the one on the right hand side is the best, the best example of this, but it's it's one that I've had been hanging around for a while. Um, just playing with colors, you can kind of de-emphasize. So the bottom right hand side, we've got like kind of everything marked on the top left hand side. We DM like used a level of opacity or, or transparency to kind of de-emphasize some of the some of the values on there. So you can see the 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 main mark, root markings much more clearly. It's probably not the best example, but we often do play with like that, that kind of the, the transparency on certain elements so that they so that we highlight the pieces that we want. And again, it's like this is a this is an approach to map which is much more communicative than pure pure representation of exactly what's there. It's we want to emphasize a certain level of information or a certain understanding. Um, so while we do have the data there, we we kind of play up certain bits and play down certain bits in order to get that message across. 
Um, this was one way I, color and transparency is a huge, is a, is a significantly large area to cover, but it, it's something really worth thinking about because it can make such a big difference to it. Um, we use size and color to add a third dimension to the maps. And I think that this is, a, this, this is the, the one of the biggest challenges with maps for me is always they're fairly, you know, if they're not interactive, um, interactivity adds a level of information that people can derive from it. But if they're not interactive, they can be, they, they don't do, maps or not, don't represent dates particularly well if it's very nuanced. So it's quite hard to get like a layered kind of a feel to a map, which gets across a lot of information because a sort of a choropleth map is like, it's one of these one of these shades of blue and it doesn't really indicate, you know, kind of a, a, another dimension. And the, the obvious dimension, for example, would be such, you know, the, there are 20% of, of, of murders happen in, well, I mean, good crime stats came out the other day. Crime stats are a good example. We have an enormous amount of murders in, 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 in a certain part of the country. You know, um, more murders is not necessarily an indicator that it's, that it's particularly more dangerous, although it obviously clearly is a bit more dangerous, but there's also, there's a population element to that. If there's a lot of people, if there's a lot of, if there are a lot of murders and there's 10 people in the population versus a lot of murders and, and, and 2 million people, it's a very different, different thing. So maps aren't, often aren't very good at displaying that kind of nuanced information, which is, you know, um, there's actually a lot of population in this area. Um, you know, so you would expect that there would be more people having traffic accidents or, you know, or more people suffering from some sort of crime. Um, so the one, the one way that you can approach that is to add the third dimension which is through the size and color. So for example, in this particular instance, this is just a sample. Um, there's, there's a, you know, the, like there's a bubble, there's bubble markers, which would represent one dimension. There's a color, which represents another, another dimension, the, the, the hue of those colors. Um, I think that kind of stretches as much as like we can do with, um, with maps. Um, after which it starts to become quite difficult to get that kind of information across. It gets it gets quite complicated. But there are the, the point is to kind of approach them and just look at them and, and think like, how do we show more than one dimension to this data as much as, much as possible? Um, but it's something to play around with. Um, and this is not really this is not this is but not really as detailed as I, it should be really. But I think one of the things that we that we overlook a lot a lot of the time with with maps is how we actually represent the information textually on a map. When one of the big challenges, you know, there's often a case, there's a tendency, and I, I just took a screenshot of something I happened to see the other day. I was like, this is fantastic, but like, you know, like if I'm navigating and I want to know all the towns in my area, that's great. But like, if I'm actually just trying to show roughly where this is located in the world, this is overwhelmingly difficult. And I think we, we tend to, we tend in general, and I mean, I could show examples, but we tend in general to approach every kind of visualization we do, but particularly maps as well, with the, the idea that how much can we take off the map before we start losing value? Like how much can we get away with? How little can we get away with? And I mean, I think there's a few people here from Media Hack who will say, like one of the things that I that we go on a lot about is like, do you need us take that off, take that off, take that off until it starts losing value, and then we start. Oftentimes, we will at that point then start thinking, okay, now we can add back something to clarify what may be what we may have lost. But the tendency to kind of the again is to put everything onto a map and go, well, there you go, it's all there, and it's technically it's all there, but it doesn't necessarily. Do like offer insight because it just becomes noisy. And there is, there is, a, there is a very big issue around creating noise on, uh, on maps and visualizations in general. Um, we, I, I mean, maybe this goes well beyond, it's more design thing, but we, we do, I mean, I think it's just, these are presentation things. And I think we, we look very closely at a lot of the work done around the world and, and so often the, the cases of the, the, the kind of visualizations that, I mean, there's visualizations that are incredibly impressive and technically they're amazing. Um, 
but the, the reality is that oftentimes the, the insights are not, are not very clear and we aren't being led down a path to understanding. So we, we tend to like look at everything if we do, if we don't need a map, if we don't need text on a map, let's take it off. If we do need map text on a map, let's be very de deliberate about the kind of information that we put onto a map. And that goes with everything. I think we, 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 we approach maps by taking, you know, if we can get away without having a legend on it, if we don't need the legend and doesn't make it make, doesn't in, like hurt understanding, then we'll do it. Um, so we probably were much more on a minimalist style of of map making than most people. Um, so I mean, those are kind of like a number of things that we kind of think about. And I, I'm going to move on very quickly to just running through some of the tools that we use. We 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 have we do occasionally make maps, maps in R, um, but we tend to work outside of that mostly. And I think that there's a number of tools that we that we use on a on a regular basis that, well, these are these are my kind of favorite tools and the ones that I use every day. And I think you know if it's informative, hopefully maybe people will learn one or two things. Um, but so um, tools, there's I've previously written a, a very long piece, a number of pieces on the tools that we use, but these are kind of my main ones that we use for most of our map working, and I'll tell you why we use them. Um, one is we use a tool called MapShaper. Um, MapShaper is available online. It's also a, a, a command line based tool. So you could download it onto your computer um, and run it from there. There are probably, there's an endless amount of things that you can do. It was developed by somebody who works at the New York Times or their geographic expert at the New York Times. Um, we use it for two, two primary things. And one is, we will use it to take in one format of a file, for example, a shape file or a JSON file, and we'll output it as something else. So usually we will output it as an SVG for a static graphic so that we can open in Illustrator or Figma, um, or we will output it as a JSON file, which is what we would use online mostly with other tools to, to, to work with. Or, and this is about simplification, this is probably the easiest tool available to simplify a map down. So when you open a map and it's an entire shape file and you want to condense the condense the, the detail down, because that oftentimes a map, the, the detail in the map, all those like little inlets and, and that around the border of a country is probably not necessarily useful if all you just want to do is like indicate the rough shape of an, of an area. Um, we use this enormously to simplify maps down and then export them out as a shapefile or as a, CS, as a SVG or a JSON file. Um, particularly online, when we're working online, we do all of our stuff online. Um, oftentimes you'll see, you'll, you'll get shapefiles and they're like 10, 10 megs, whatever, you know, they're fairly substantial. Um, we will simplify that down often to just a few kilobytes in order to re re render online as quickly as possible. So we use this all the time. Um, there are other tools, more complex tools, but we, but I find that this is the quickest and the easiest way to work with it. Um, this is a relatively new find, and we kind of use it all the time, or we use it quite a lot nowadays, which is quite nice. Um, this is when you don't have a map, uh, when you want to make your own map or your own shapes. Um, so GeoJSON, there's a few out there, but GeoJSON.io, um, we use quite a lot. We've used it for things, for example, where you know, we've got a map of South Africa, but we want to indicate the route from one place to another, and we want to convert that into an into a st static file. Um, and we don't want to just randomly draw a line for the, the N3 from Joburg to Durban, for example. Um, GeoJSON allows you to draw on a map and convert those to geographic points, um, which then you could use in something else. So we could use it in QGIS or in R or in Leaflet or one of the other tools. So we find it is very useful because, we, because a lot of our work is kind of storytelling based. So sometimes being able to illustrate particular areas and, and, and render and represent them accurately is important to us. It's quite a fun tool to play with. Um, you can just draw shapes or lines or whatever, um, and then copy and paste the JSON out and open that in one of your one of the other tools that you that you want to use. Um, so we use it, we use it in most instances, we use this together with MapShaper. So the JSON, we could open a JSON file in MapShaper and then export it to a static file, like an SVG, which we 
would then work with an illustrator or, fig, or figma we use figma mostly um so that's that's quite a nice one it, it, we did a uh, this is relatively these sorts of tools are relatively relatively new um years ago we worked on a project around dipslet um in johannesburg um, which is effectively not mapped and there's a number of different areas in the thing and we kind of eventually ended up sort of hand drawing that map and guessing the shapes of it in retrospect something like this would have been fantastic because we could have done it much more accurately than than you could have done by hand a number of years ago that map's still out there one of the few maps of this um leaflet is our go-to and leaflet works in r leaflet works in python leaflet works in javascript leaflet works pretty much anywhere um Honestly, I think, I mean, for most custom built tools, we use Leaflet the most, but the caveat is you do need a little bit of experience, but I, I mean, I think if you're, if you're familiar with, um, with R or anything like that, you probably can use it. We use it most, we use it for pretty much all the projects that we use. Although I have to say Mapbox is, I don't know if I've got Mapbox yet. Mapbox is coming up very fast as our preferred, preferred tool for, for visualizing. Um, information and mostly because Mapbox is has got a range of leaflets, fairly basic. It does, it, it's very good for just showing maps. Leaf, uh, Mapbox has got new facilities like you can draw interactive maps where you can kind of fly over parts of the country and and, illust and bring in certain layers at a time. So we use that for that that a lot. And QGIS, QGIS was always like one of my one of our tools that we thought we really should use a lot more. And until we discovered how to use SQL or SQL in QGIS, um, it wasn't always the most friendly pro program in the world, but, when, but if you know a little bit of SQL and you know GIS, uh, QGIS, um, it's a hugely powerful tool. So we, we would use that for SQL, which is something we relatively recently started using is just taking in map data using um, QGIS is SQL built in SQL tools to kind of filter the data and export export new versions of a map. It's it's super powerful, um, but it is it is tech. It is a bit geeky. You need a little bit of SQL experience. But um, that I think is something that's very exciting at the moment for us. Um, uh, Mapbox. We use Mapbox not a lot, but we are kind of edging towards it. I think it's. It, it allows you to do these sorts of interactive storytelling maps, which in the communications world, the media world are very popular um, and, and attractive enough that they get a lot of attention. So these are relatively easy to, to build. If you have a tame developer who knows the basics of JavaScript, you can pretty much build one of these on your own. So we're using that. And Al Jazeera uses them a lot. They've done some fantastic work around this. So it's worth looking at those. Um, and this is something I'm quite excited about. We haven't used this nearly as much, although I have a project in mind. Um, it's a Google product, which is it's time it's time series. Um, it it kind of it's an overlay of 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 data on 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 maps that shows key areas. So, in, for example, in this in this instance, obviously the blue is the water, the Tiavatis Cliff, and the Western Cape during that 2017 drought when you know it was pretty much dried up. Um, and really, it's a it's a it's a near real time overlay of data um, on on the map of key things like settlements, water, um, agriculture, uh, industry, etc. And it's a relatively new product, which I'm quite excited about. I think there's a lot of potential in this coming down the line. Um, so those are kind of like the main. I think those are the main tools that that we that that we use and how we approach the way that we make maps. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that because I, I think if there's anyone's got a question or anything else that I can, can answer, well, um, we why don't just, and this is a bit of a plug, but I think it's also useful. We make an effort to write about a lot of the stuff that we learn and that we know on what on our medium page, which is inside.mediahack.ca.za. We we've got a number of of kind of tutorials on how to make your own maps. We did one around the Kenyan election, how to map um, a Kenyan the Kenyan election, including links to the data that we used, um, how to make customized maps using MapShaper, Figma, uh, Flourish. We use Flourish a lot. 
Um, so we've got, we, we kind of try every week to write up one piece on the work that we do. Um, and, and we just share it. I think it's important that people share this sort of information. So that's pretty much me. I, I mean, there's a ton more I could talk about, but that kind of running out of time. Thank you so much, Alistair. That was awesome and very um, informative. Thank you so, so much.